So what we're going to do, I've been talking to many of you last night, um, we're going to do half the session really, I'm going to kind of give you some toolkits that you could use in innovation, very hardcore, very successful um, tools that have been refined in my career, and, and both at you know, DBS, Microsoft, and, and in, the, in the jungle. And, and then the last half, we'll, we'll go through the, the, I think the four questions, and, and I'll give my view on, on how you succeed. Um, you know, there is innovation is the most misunderstood word in the world, I think it's the most overused word. Um, in, in my personal view, I use a cheek. I could generate a thousand ideas in a week. You know, uh, it's really about how you turn those into you know executables. And we'll talk through a lot of the processes. So you know, I'll give you the slide deck afterwards. So there's quite a lot in there. There's a lot of stuff um, from, from my um, career, really. Uh, just the first thing: why does DBS innovate? We have no choice. But, you know, our industry is under mass disruption. As all industries move towards digitization we're more likely being threatened by the big, things on one side by the big digital businesses like Alibaba, Tencent, Facebook, Apple, Google, and on the other side, you know, tens of thousands of startups called FinTech companies are eating away at our industry. And so for us, it really is, you know, a life of death scenario for our industry. Um, especially in China, you'll see this mass disruption happen. Actually, half of the entire payments in China now are not done on credit card, they're done using fintech companies, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, you know, what challenges do we have internally? You'll find this in corporates, you'll find this in governments, you'll find this everywhere. It's really about the culture. And, and so you look at the bank culture, and generally corporate culture is very hierarchical, um, especially in Asia. You know, um, people won't, you know, say no or, or argue with someone two or three levels, four levels above them. Um, you know, there's no right to dissent. You can kind of do what the boss says no matter what. Um, banks are very risk averse. Most corporates are risk averse. They don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to experiment and try things. They're certainly not going to release stuff into beta. Now, that's a massive issue, especially when you think about getting products and services out there. Um, that if you're not going to be ambitious enough, uh, and this is the time we need to be ambitious. And, and most corporates own everything. They own every single thing. Look at the fact we own the ATOs, we own the branches, we own our online platform, um, we own our technology, we build our own data centers, you know, we absolutely own everything. And then you, you kind of mirror that to when I spent seven years at a tech company. And a tech company, the my stand just here, a tech company culture is quite a flat structure. So you can happily dissent with some of two, three levels above you. And that's actually business as normal. You don't worry about your career, you don't worry about your bonus. That's just how they operate. Everyone has a voice in the organization and it's a power to make decisions. <laughs> um, tech companies are very, very experimental. Uh, always releasing things um, in beta, doing live experiments with customers and, and try new things many times. Some are too experimental. I'd say Google are probably on that end. They do a lot of stuff that doesn't seem to monetize. Um, but still some great innovation coming out of them as well. And, and tech companies are, be a speaker somewhere, tend to operate in ecosystems. If you look at Microsoft, um, for every dollar Microsoft makes, the, the, the ecosystem makes eight. So that's about a trillion US dollars a year of economic value they generate. Uh, and so you can't actually buy a product from Microsoft, you have to buy it through a partner. Um, if you want it installed, they want to be certified. Um, if you want to put up a piece of machinery, you have to pay Dell and inside Intel. And so the, the impact of Microsoft, when they operate, they have 100,000 staff, but they have tens of millions of people maybe around the world making sure Microsoft is successful. And actually, that was the, the one big thing that Steve Jobs said he really admired about, about Bill Gates. And, and so we're in this culture, we're trying to move towards this culture, and it's incredibly hard. And um, I've aged about 100 years in, in two and a half. And, and so we set up the innovation group. Um, but we just did the exact opposite of every other innovation group because most innovation groups fundamentally don't succeed. The average life of an innovation group is about two years. Um, so we never invent anything. We're one of the only innovation groups in the world that it's actually a sack of elephants. Uh, not a sack of my tea. Uh, but we joke about it, we never invent anything. Um, we don't hire tech technologies. Again, we're the only innovation groups in the world that do that. 
and who don't hire any experts. In fact, expert is a dirty word, in my mind, actually. Um, they, they seem too strong in one direction. And, um, and so we create a safe place to fail. We get people passionate about doing things differently and, and working towards a higher purpose. And we make the impossible possible. We get people to put their hands back into that too hard bucket and get that thing out and let's work out how we can execute it and raise their ambition level. Uh, as part of this, it's really important to have the science of innovation. Innovation is a repeatable industrial process, and anyone can do it. For me, ideas are cheap, creativity is cheap. It's the process to go from a problem to a product that's really, really important. That's what's made us so successful. We have 340 of these programs running at the moment inside the organization. That's the kind of scale, about 5,000 staff involved, about four from the bank. And so, because we don't invent anything, the onus of innovation is put on the staff. It's their job to be the innovation group. We're there to support them in their initiatives. Um, the, the primary tool we use, does anyone here do design thinking, human centered design? Yeah, brilliant tool for um, really kind of getting from the immersion piece um, through to kind of delivery. And essentially, design thinking or human centered design is really getting to understand what your customer, or your user, or your partner, whatever it is, or your donator, is, is trying to achieve. And we call it a job to be done. Good example in finance is, do you know no one has ever bought a mortgage? Who don't wake up and go, I need a mortgage today. I can't wait, I've got to go to a bank and fill out 400 forms. No, they get married. They have a new child, they move to a new country. They need somewhere to live. And so the customer is thinking about these things and they turn up at the bank and the bank goes, you need mortgage. But they're not buying a mortgage, they're buying somewhere to live, they're on a journey, we call it a customer journey. And so the important thing is to get inside the mind of who you're designing for and innovating for. We use a 4D model, which means we start with discovery. We spend time immersing ourselves in the problem with the customer or, or the partner. We did an interesting thing, we spent time with some customers, we were talking about credit cards, went to this uh, old lady's house, I said, we said, oh, can you show us your credit card, do you think about spending? She went to the freezer and she pulled out a block of ice. And I thought, okay, we've got a crazy one here, let's try and get out. And she goes, no, see, my credit card's inside. And I said, oh, okay, hopefully she has not got like the kitchen scissors or something. So he said, why don't you get a block of ice? You can put it in your wallet, you know. And she said, because I'm an impulsive spender. And for the time it takes for the ice to thaw out, means that I'll lose the impulse, and then I won't use my card. And so you wouldn't have got that insight by asking a questionnaire on how you use credit cards. You really have to immerse yourself in what the customers are doing. When I was working with the Gates Foundation out in Uganda, you know, we were looking at bringing finance into farmers. I was flying around a little prop plane and, and sitting in fields with farmers. And they had a concept of a box, where the village comes together every month, they put some money in the box and they bury it in a field. Um, and actually off that, they create a product on, on mobile called the box for the weekend. So trying to replicate what the customers were already doing, their workarounds, they were using them, because people always solve their problems. That's what people don't get. That they found a way, they always find a way to work around it. And then how do we take that kind of manual process of going the box in the field? How do we turn that into a kind of um, digital process and a bank account which replicates um, what they were currently doing? And so a lot of people get this wrong, this notion. They ask questionnaires. Now, if you ask questionnaires, people tend to tell you what you want to hear, or they just play the lie, or they don't know their life, or they don't know. Immersion is following people around. Watch what they do, rather than ask what they do. And get that immersion piece right, it's critical, critical to get those insights to innovate around. Too many people come up with an idea. We don't come up with ideas. We do the 4D, and then we come up and write up all the things we learn about that customer, that journey. And then we go into workshop groups and we start the kind of design thinking. We start mapping out the customer journey. So what was the journey? For example, the journey for paying for a taxi 
surely this will just get your car on tap. No, it isn't. The journey starts when somebody wakes up, looks outside, it's raining today, I want to get a taxi, they get onto the taxi booking app, they book the taxi, they wait for the taxi, they get in the taxi, they remind the driver where they're going, they do maybe read a book on the way, then they pay, then they get out of the taxi, then they review the taxi. And so you've got to work out everything that that subject is doing but because they only touch you in one small space and so much innovation has gone wrong, you just focus on that small part where you engage with that user rather than thinking about the entire chain. We did this with uh, mortgages and uh, we looked at the journey of people buying houses and we created an app where you could hold up your mobile phone and use an augmented reality and point at a building and it would come up and show you whether it's for sale, the floor plans, the photos, the local school. And so the only time we saw that customer was when they came into a bank branch to buy a mortgage. But now we're part of their property selection process. And so we're a lot more relevant to the job they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve. Um, in the developed stage, this is where we start to make prototypes. We do experiments. We, we go out and test with live customers, literally run down the street, stop people in shopping malls, show them our paper prototype. Um, get their insights, see how they use it, pivot, turn it into a digital prototype. Again, keep doing that and keep looping and experimenting and creating assumptions on what we think they would like and then testing those assumptions until we get the exact thing we feel the customers would like and then we rapidly deliver using kind of agile software development techniques. And so the 4D model, let's say we have 340 projects um, going through this model does mean that you get from customer problem to product or service in market a lot quicker uh, with a lot more science and insight. And it really resonates then with, the, with the end user you're, you're working with. Uh, what we also did is we do a lot of experiments. Corporate innovation tends to, uh, and actually most innovation, tends to be people who think they're too smart, sat in a room, brainstorming, come up with ideas. Yeah? They all sit around and go, yeah, I know this market, we should do this. Someone else says, yeah, I know products, we should do this. Someone says, I know tech, we should do this. And, and then they come up with these ideas going, yeah, this is great, we're so great. All they've done is they've invented a product for themselves. And so what we do is we run experiments. Before we do anything, before we build anything, we work out a way to test our assumptions. We assume that if we build a mortgage app where people can look at, through their camera at property that they will then take a mortgage out with us. So before we incur any cost, how do we test that assumption? Again, I see a lot of innovation fail because the people who invented it make assumptions based on their own experiences and what they want, rather than actually testing those out in the market as quickly and cheaply as you can. And we set up this program where staff could leave their job for one day a month, they join the innovation group, and we teach them how to run experiments. They'd actually, in that one day a month, run experiments on their own business unit. And this is how we got to a thousand experiments. We had lots and lots of change that happened across the organization. And people were experimenting with all sorts of things call centers, card, finance, you know, how they do risk, how we hire, um, how we motivate people, how we go off. Every single part of the business that's been running the experiments and just testing assumptions. Those things that we thought were, were true. Actually, are they true? Did we just assume um, what was happening there? Uh, another thing in science is ambition level. And when I raise my own ambition level, when I start a project, the first thing I do is build a North Star. And that is the ultimate, what, what I can perceive as the ultimate endpoint for what this innovation could be. And that's a great way to raise your ambition. Um, so you can take anything, transport. What's the ultimate in personal transport? Teleportation. Yeah, it's, it's the ultimate, yeah. In fact, I'm there. I'm here, I'm there. Um, and then you create a North Star on what the ultimate is, and then you fix the endpoint to where you are, and then you put this, a few key milestones back into that. And what that does, it helps increase your ambition. So rather than go from where you are now and incrementally move forward, you actually go to the absolute endpoint and work backwards. 
And that really helps you then think about how do I create the ultimate product. And even in, I get a lot of questions. Well, I want to be in innovation. How do I be in innovation? Or people say to me, I'm a great innovator. Right, I say to them, where do you work? I work with a telco. Okay, who's the best telco in the world? Uh, I don't know. Okay, who's the best thought leader on the future of telco? I don't know. Who's written books on telco? I don't know. Which are the best conferences to go to learn about the future of telco? I don't know. These are things you should know. Yeah, whatever job you're doing, know what world best looks like. Whatever it is. Whether you're moving paper from here to there. Who's the best in the world at that? What do they do? What's the future of that kind of role or task or industry? Again, that helps you with your ambition. Unless you know what world's best is, you're just gonna, you're not gonna shoot for the start, you're gonna hit the ground. Another thing we brought in, so there's some things around science, and I can give you backup information on good courses on design thinking and future casting, the kind of building the North Star. Um, another thing we have to do is bring it outside in thinking, to so bring externals to come in and educate bank staff and be part of our innovation process and to bring completely different viewpoints in, in how we think about delivering products and services. Um, some of the programs we did, this was Unicorn. Um, my team come to me and they said, hey Neil, we want to look at internship. We want to, you know, dream about internship. And I said, well, that's not really that ambitious. I said, you know, there is a massive train wreck coming in education. So as in the, in the future people will be working more in the gig economy, you know, the stuff they're being taught in schools does not support that. Learning about British kings and queens does not help you. They need to be trained as entrepreneurs. That needs to be the skill. Instead of looking at reinvent internships, why don't we try and reinvent education in Singapore? Because I love ambitious goals. Um, and so we went for it. So what we did is uh, we uh, went around the universities in Singapore. We asked the students to send us a 30 second video on how they're going to how they're going to change the world. We got about 250 videos. From that, we selected the 50 best candidates. We put them through a two-day workshop involving some design thinking and experimentation, put them in different groups, put them in, you know, things when they're on the road. We had a psychologist watching them to see how they perform under stress, how they partnered, how they led. After two days, we picked the 20 best students and we never brought them in the bank. We put them in a startup center and then we took the four biggest challenges across the bank and we split them into teams. We got the students to invent a company or product to solve the bank's four biggest challenges. And then we coached them, we mentored them, we, we brought them startup founders, we taught them design thinking and experimentation. At the end of their internship, they had to pitch to the executive that ran that division. Of the four concepts, three are going to production and the bank hiring half the interns. And so it was a great way to quickly get high quality talent working on bank problems and to have an internship which is the first in the world. So they weren't there typing stuff in Excel, they weren't taking the bosses dry cleaning. Um, they were doing something very meaningful and impactful. And a few of them actually said, can you help us set up our own company now? So we're looking at that as well. This was so impactful in Singapore. I did a talk, I was on a panel um, and I made a comment that education is fundamentally broken in Singapore, um, which probably wasn't a great idea. So I got an email the next day from the Ministry of Education. Uh, the Minister of Education will meet you 3.30 next Tuesday. I'm in trouble. And so I turned up, and they didn't care about the comment. I said, what's this about uniform? We took them through uniforms. We showed them that. Next week, Minister of Finance wants to meet me. Uniform. Ministry of Defense, India, uniform. Attorney General, uniform. Deputy Prime Minister, uniform. All the government agencies want to know about uniform. And they're actually building now big programs for uniform style kind of training exercise to turn students into entrepreneurs. And so my kind of tongue in cheek thing to my, my staff to say, hey, let's reinvent education in Singapore, we may have actually helped push that kind of challenge along the way. So big ambitious goals, big work. 
Out of that, we've got a, a, an amazing product uh, for EM Bound, something the bank staff could never invent. Their frame of reference, the way they think, they could never invent something like this. Only students could think something completely new on uh, delivering how we do EM Bound for you. Another thing we did uh, to bring in outside in thinking was they asked me to look at how we train our executives on digital mindset. And she said, hey, you've got any good presentations. I said, yeah, but that's not going to be in a digital mindset. What we should do is we should get them to set up their own startup company. I said, that will do it. They'll really understand it. And um, nobody believed me could think to do it, but I thought we could. So for three days, we took the top 250 executive team of the bank. CEO down, apart from the CEO, we split them into teams of three, we paired them with a startup. And again, we took big challenges across the bank, 25 challenges, and we got the executives paired with startups. We took them through a process, again, rapid prototyping, executives running around shopping malls. At the end of it, they had to deliver a business model, a go to market strategy, and a working mobile prototype on how they're going to solve that challenge, and they had a pitch to the CEO. Um, I'll show you a video of how this worked. We ended up running 15 of these across the bank last year. can't put people in front of a blackboard and teach them what digital is all about. The only way you can do it is through experiential learning. A Legendron Hackathon is so exciting because it allows us to check many things in one go. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to get our best and brightest and give them a tremendously different exposure to the new digital world that is on us which allows you to get startups, people who think differently, mix and match them with our people, and give them an opportunity to think in a different way. It's just fantastic. They were created to give people a sense of what it was like to work in an intense, rapid innovation environment, um, to come up with solutions in a very short period of time that would spark inspiration within the business to do something around those solutions. We have uh, 85 of our senior people from all over the world involved in this and uh, total soccer team. There's about 150 people uh, involved in this production. It's a very good study. They're getting to plan with these immersion into some customers' problems, build something, and act and, and get something delivered within this three days. This is giving them a microcosm of the way they should be operating. Because you're the experimental and run. There is no way they don't fail. They have to fail in order to succeed. So I think people are now less afraid of failure. I would say the biggest thing in creative thinking is trying to incorporate elements of human centered design. I think it's something we just going to talk about it, but really kind of bringing in those principles and saying this is how you apply this to solve a problem. And I think it's stuff that they can take back and say, okay, we're not just going to solve it in traditional purposes, let's really understand who is the end user of this product or solution and how do we serve their needs. We can perform that alone as well. It would be saving out of the box. Don't think about the boundaries first. There are a lot of possibilities. This will help me do my job better. It's going to change my work style, to change uh, my attitude and my customers. And that actually the tools are actually quite simple and straightforward for them to be able to use and take back to the workplace. So the hackathon has many different outputs. Clearly the idea is something that's of real value, um, but really the culture change is what's most important. Uh, uh, okay. So by the end of today, we'll come to 50 things, 50 solutions, we'll quickly ask the top performers and customers. That's why we're open at the corners. That's why we're having our mission to create joyful banking. It's to create a leadership environment where the whole organization is filled with leaders who have a common vision of purpose. Perhaps for some reason, most important, we have this notion of trying to change.
create the culture of the company. Of trying to create the confidence in ourselves to take some risks, to experiment a bit, to try a few things which are different, to have fun while we're doing it. That's the kind of company we're trying to build. And the Megacon is a fantastic tool to be able to bring that culture to life. So you hear a lot about hackathons, but they tend to be just purely technical exercises. You know, just code up something. There's no customer interaction, there's no customer immersion. There's very little design thinking, experimentation, or iteration. This now is a standard training course, HR on it, and this was all started in partnership actually with HR and, and uh, Digibank, the PBS. And so um, they run. I think they actually they did another one yesterday. And so it's a training course for, for staff, but it can be used. If you're trying to work with an external agency and co-innovate, this is a great process to do that. It's an excellent process to quickly bring two disparate entities together. If we had, you couldn't see the more disparate people. We had like senior bank execs in suits and ties and young startup kids, you know, in a team together trying to solve these challenges. But you need a structure. You can't just like I get frustrated with brainstorming sessions. You need a structure. You need to be able to kind of do blue sky and then synthesize, um, and then go to the next stage and kind of filter, and then just keep going through processes until you go from kind of the same problem to product. Um, it needs to be very structured and well governed. Another thing that we we spend a lot of time on is ecosystems. I'm sure, many people in the room work with ecosystems. Um, but there is a, an absolute art in, in how you enter, um, how you message, and, and how you monetize. You know, just run it. Monetize doesn't have to be money. It could be influence. You can basically get outcomes out of the ecosystem. It's, it's a very, uh, very new science in, in how this operates. And how do you get thousands or millions of people essentially focus on making you successful and then what's the value exchange across the ecosystem. To do that we actually did our first big ecosystem play the, with a company called Manulife, a large insurance company. Um, the bank and Manulife signed an agreement. So the first thing we did, like the hackathon, but it was really spread over a much longer time period. We had half PBS staff, half Manulife, uh, people who didn't even know each other, both from finance but from different ends of finance. Um, and this, I'll take you through the structure, give you an idea of what the big project looks like from, from start to finish. I actually went live two weeks ago. Uh, we started a research phase in December, January, four weeks. Um, by uh, uh, We actually got a research company to go out and do the commercial piece for us and get those insights there that we're going to innovate over around how people want to buy insurance. Uh, we did a three day kind of make a lot of that and we come up. Um, uh, with two winners at that, Insta Shore and Q. And then we went into develop and deliver, so kept creating prototypes, getting in front of customers, getting some insight, getting some surprises, pivot in, build new prototypes, keep going, keep going. And then eventually moving into the software development feature, the demo day. Uh, Insta Shore went on to be the one that actually codified, and it went live two weeks ago. It is quite possibly the dumbest, easiest way to buy insurance. It really, really is. It was so easy, you had to spend a lot of time with the regulator to make sure that you know they would sign off from a regulatory perspective. Um, it's just two clicks. So in DBS, on the DBS uh, digital banking app, it pops up and says, hey, I notice your salary is 3,200 a month. Um, in case anything happens to your job, do you want to insure this for a dollar a week? Yes, no. Uh, yes, done, you bought insurance. Uh, very, very simple. And that came through the insights of what customers were concerned about, what they want to protect, how much they pay, et cetera, et cetera. Good structured process. Something else that we did is we started to enter the startup ecosystem. I thought I mentioned this last night. And we very much went in, in both with the message and the reality of, of we're going to turn Singapore to World's FinTech Hub. And we want to develop entrepreneurs. And the reality is fact that that, that was that we don't take equity, we don't take anything off the startups, 
um, actually a quarter of the accelerator will put social enterprise in there. So if people are building bikes out of bamboo and all sorts of stuff, I call them panda meals on wheels. Mm -hmm. um, after the tenth time I said that, I don't know if you've been spun with them or not. Um, and, and, uh, and it's all gifts, so we pay them $25,000. But part of the get for us was that we built a mentor network inside the organization with mentor startups. They really get to understand how startups operate, what their culture is, how can they build stuff which customers love, how they can do viral marketing, how to think about software development. So it's an exchange where they would learn about how to build products and learn about finance. Uh, we would learn a lot more about startups. This has been hugely successful uh, for us and positioned us actually as one of the top banks in the world for working with fintech companies. But it's the way we did it. And so we, we get about three times as many startups on a join our accelerator than our competitors have now, now got um, because of the way we operate. That we're very transparent. Um, we don't take up the, you know, there's no catch in that. Another thing we've done, which I'm sure, who's heard of APIs? Who's APIs, yeah. So the concept is rather than kind of just building a, a product, uh, like a mobile app or, or a web product, is actually you create a load of services that other people can build products on top of you. And this is really important when you use an ecosystem. Technically, we've moved to a point where someone can build a bank on top of us, a whole bank just by using services so that you know in the background their code will be calling our servers and say hey uh, let me log this person in let me get your account balance let me do a payment and it's all in the background and they kind of own the customer experience and so when you enter ecosystems you've got to have obviously the right message the right process you've got to build a team to manage your partners and you've got to have defined outcomes and kpis but you also need the technology platform to wire in these partners. And then you've got to work out all sorts of stuff, you know, legal, risk, compliance, revenue share is important as well. So if an ecosystem partner, I don't know, sells a credit card, how much do we give them for that? They bring it to us, we've got to do a revenue share with them. The best businesses operate like this. Um, and I find that's the best way. So when I did a startup, I do it, I've got a well, I've got a few other fintech staff in Australia. We never even built the product. We put the business model out, we mapped out the ecosystem, and then went into the big ecosystem players and said, hey, look, we think we're doing this. Uh, are you interested? And actually, one of them, a really big one, said, I said, yeah. And also, we said, we're looking for investors. They said, okay, I'll give you access to my 250,000 customers, and I want 5% of the company, and I'll pay for it. We never even built the product. That the product's not ready until next month. Because we just focus on the model, the business model, and then went after the ecosystem, and then we build a product where most startups focus way too much time on technology and then work out how to sell it and what the monetization model and what the part and channel and all that kind of stuff is later. It's really important you understand the step up front. And so we're on releasing. The, these APIs so we can communicate and onboard new partners very, very quickly, very cheaply. Uh, the final thing I'll talk about, which is highly underrated, given I've got time, is sales. And I'm not talking about selling a product. I'm talking about sales for me is the, the most useful skill I have as an innovator. I spend a lot of time as a sales, and I say that because I need to get people to do stuff. And getting people to do stuff is sales. And the biggest most common mistake I see in even in corporates and startups and NGOs, social enterprises, government, you name it, cannot sell. And so they come to me with a with no value proposition or or a misunderstanding of what I'm trying to achieve. Um, you know, I've had people come to me and basically I you know they've told me their thing. I said, so let me get this right. You want me to do all these things for you and I get nothing in return. I'm like, wow. Uh, oh, we never thought about that. Really, I'm just the CIO of the bank. You know. I, I see this so many times. About 10% of startups can actually sell. So don't think of this selling. Just think about how you get someone to do something you need them to do, whether it's a volunteer, whether it's someone in the government, um, or whether it's a potential partner or a customer. There is an art of science to this thing. 
The R is, you know, do not sell your product. To, to do a big sell, I'm talking these, you know, this is big end kind of selling. Um, I used to run a billion dollar sales business at Microsoft, I used to run a bank insurance business in Asia. Um, you have to sell yourself first. You can't just go in a meeting and go, hi, I've got a great product, look at the features. Or, hey, I'm trying to raise some funds, let's talk about that. No, no, no. People buy from people, they need to trust you, they need to believe in you. The first thing you sell when you go in is yourself, that you're credible, you're trustworthy, you know what you're doing, and you have a good moral compass. The second thing you sell is your company. So once you've sold yourself, then you sell your company, our companies come to trust. Then finally you sell your product and your features and the other stuff. Now, if it's not a product, it could be a strategy. It could be a fund. It doesn't matter what the thing is you're trying to achieve, that that thing comes last. I just need to build that credibility. Just some really simple stuff, maybe for the young kids out there. I see this a lot. I get emails from people saying to me, can I meet you tomorrow? It's like, yeah, yeah, I've got 50 meetings a week on average, but I'll try and fit you in. What that says to me is two things. One, it's disrespectful to my time and position. I don't care about that, I'm quite a humble guy. Secondly, they can't manage their time. And if you can't manage your time and I've never even met you, what's it going to be like working with you? It's going to be a nightmare. When's that product ready? Oh, tomorrow. Tomorrow comes. Is it ready? Oh, no, next week. Well, no, no, no. You know, you immediately set the tone is of you're not professional and, and you can't deliver. If you go, oh, I'll meet next week, tomorrow, meet then, meet, you know, for coffee in the morning at 8.30. A lot of the time it's listening to what isn't said. People very rarely say what they mean in meetings. Yeah? But you can get an indication of what they're thinking. Yeah. And so when somebody says, hey, you know, I'm not so, so, so sure about this, talk me through, you know, where this has been done. And, uh, they're not saying they're interested in hearing what you've done. They're saying I'm scared. There's risk. I'm worried. And so listen to what they're not saying. But where are they coming from? Why do they say that? You know, really good salespeople always pick that out. Because people aren't going to sit there and go, I'm scared. If this goes wrong, I'll get fired. Um, be clear. The amount of meetings I have, just come. You, there has to be an outcome. Yeah. You have the meeting for a reason. So go in with an agenda, leave with an outcome, even if the outcome is just the next meeting. Um, and understand the people in the room. Who's in the room? Who is it? What do they do? What have they got to do with the project? Do they have money? Are they going to supply people? Are they going to do the PR? What do they do? The amount of times I've seen people talk to the wrong people. You know, you know this person is telling that person a message, I'm like, wait a minute. You're telling this person technology, they're, they're in marketing. <laughs> so work out what everyone is and what their objectives are. It's personal. People buy from people. Companies do not buy from companies. That's really digitally online to be, not in person. It's always about the people. Um, you know, there is a science in how you achieve stuff. You can use this for anything, yeah? You need to know where you are in the process. Again, I see this a lot. Startups say, hey, we're just about to close this funding, or we're just about to close this deal. I'm like, talk me through it. And they think they're well, actually, that's the day coming to see the baby. They think they're there, but I go, no, you're here. Yeah, because you say different things as you go through. You prospect, you qualify whether you want to work or not work with this entity. You start to develop a solution, uh, and then you build a solution, and you prove that you can do this. You start to close, and then you deploy. It's really important where you know what stage you're at. Startups die, and social enterprises die because they think that the four customers they've got, they're here, and they're just about to do the deal, just about to do the deal. And they're burning money like this. And then suddenly they run out of money because they never closed because they were not here. And corporates and governments will talk you to death, literally, if you're a startup. They'll so just chat to you, they want to learn. They may not be interested in buying your product. You think they are, so you have to have a, a process to drive towards that. If there's not one of these four people in the room, you're in the wrong meeting. And so, in an organization, you've got to work out who's the power, who makes the decision to work with you, whatever that looks like. 
who pays for that? Who's the money? So they could be separate, they could be the same person. Who's the fox? The fox is the friendly person who always wants to talk to you and have coffee. Now, again, a big mistake I mean, people will spend all their time on the fox and they're burning cash and then they go, well, you buy it. The fox goes, well, no, I'm not buy it. I'm just helping you out. But the fox is the one you can work out, get them to help you work out who the power, who the money is. And then the blocker is basically the person who doesn't like you and trying to shut the thing down. Um, so it's good to know who that person is as well. So if, if there isn't these people in a meeting, find them in a meeting. You're not going to move the thing forward. Um, yeah, this is a thing. This is really, really useful. This you can use this for venture capital pitching, for sales pitching, for presentations like this, for elevator pitches, whatever you want to use it for. It's a very, very simple structure for doing a pitch. Um, let's do one now, this. So it's a, it's a controller for a presentation. Situation is that, uh, you know, on stage, I can't press my own slides. The complication is I don't look professional when I'm on stage. The implication is people might not ask me to present again. So my proposal is we need a clicker. The benefits of a clicker, uh, sorry, uh, we need a clicker. The action I need you to take is to buy 200 clickers to empower all your presenters. The benefits of this will look much more professional on stage and we'll get more presentations. It's a very structured way to sell, very good for senior people, and for all situations where you have to do a pitch. I'll give you this deck. Um, uh, we'll skip that in the interest of time. We'll skip that one. These are just pla different plans you can use to, to be very scientific about how you close. Um, thank you. That's me. I'll, I'll move on to the questions now. Uh, or we can take some questions about this.